Welcome to the Meat and Potatoes podcast sponsored by Bank of America. Today we are joined by Felicia Lewis and Maury Polson, and we're coming from the stage and not the studio, which is exciting. Um, we'll start with introductions. Uh, Felicia, can you tell us your title and what do you do for Bank of America? Then we'll go over to you, Maury. Yeah, happy to. Uh, so again, Felicia Lewis. I am the managing director for our expansion markets. That's effectively every place across the country where we have three or 400,000 clients, but no or very few branches. My team and I stand them up from dirt to the actual facilities. All right, that makes sense. Maury? I'm Maury Paulson. Thanks for having us here today. I'm president of Bank of America for Utah. I'm tasked with coordinating our eight lines of business in the state and also community outreach. Very cool, and this is a good way to uh, outreach to the community because Silicon Slopes uh, touches a lot of points. So um, we've had a lot of uh, great interactions with Bank of America over the years. We uh, really appreciate y'all's support and thank you for you know sponsoring this Meat and Potatoes podcast, which will be a, a multi-part series because there's some really cool stories to tell of how Banking and what Bank of America does is a key part of the ecosystem, uh, probably well known, but uh, there's probably a lot of nuances to it that people might not appreciate about banking and what y'all do. Um, so we're just going to have fun. Uh, we'll, we'll throw a lot of open-ended questions to learn your story, the story of the expansion into Utah and how it all kind of folds into uh, a successful ecosystem. Uh, starting with you, Felicia, and sometimes you guys can ping pong these back and forth. Um, why did Bank of America decide to open a new uh, market here in Utah? Yeah, uh, Utah is a fabulous market. It's growing, um, the population growth, the economy, it's just wonderful. And uh, before we launched here, we did a host of research and we realized we had, again, three or 400,000 clients here already. They had a mortgage with us or a credit card with us, um, but they didn't have a way to do in-person banking if they chose to. Um, and so bringing the branch network uh, to Utah was another way for us to continue to help them deepen the relationship uh, with us. And, and still, even today, uh, they're able to you know, come see our teams in our financial centers, or they can bank like many of us bank, which is on our mobile device. So, but that was what drove us here, is we recognized we had a host of clients sitting here already. Yeah, if I could add too, um, Merrill Lynch, which is one of the eight lines of business, has been here actually since 1948. So uh, Bank of America has had, a, has had a presence here for many years. We also had um, commercial banking, business banking here prior to introducing the financial centers. You know, when you look at Utah, it's kind of like for those of us who have been around here and live here, it's a bit of a no-brainer. We have one of the fastest growing states or states in the nation. We have uh, an economy that is very resilient and it's a great environment for businesses and so for us to come here with all our lines of business, it just seemed like a natural thing to do and, and to support, provide all our lines to provide the full support to businesses and consumers in this area. Yeah, and I remember like going and seeing the Christmas lights and there's the Merrill Lynch building downtown, the Thundering Herd. I don't know if that's what they're still called, but that's yeah, what they we, used to be called. We still call ourselves the Thundering Herd, yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, just on the, the Mount Rushmore, very cool stories. Um, I did not know that they had been in Utah that long, um, but obviously with the bowl and, and the branding, kind of an amazing brand, and then uh, everyone knows Bank of America. So um, there's a lot of uh, science and math and data that goes to this, even though we say it's pretty common sense, right? Like a robust economy, plenty of accounts. Uh, it's not like throwing darts at the dartboard. Where should we go? Should it be Gunnison? No? Oh, let's go to Salt Lake. Uh, and that's probably where you come in and your team, Felicia, of uh, the thought and analysis behind that. So you've got the quantitative and the qualitative. How do you guys couple those up and ultimately decide, like, we're going to put time resources to this market, and this is going to be the timeline of how we do it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's a host of data that we are able to utilize population growth. Um, we're looking at the deposits, you know, in the market. We're looking at uh, the housing market, et cetera, to assess, you know, 
going to Utah. So as Maury mentioned, it was a no-brainer for us to come here. Uh, and then we had to decide, okay, Utah's a pretty big place. Where in Utah do we go? So that's where our local real estate team has been phenomenal in you know, really assessing where are our clients so that we can put our financial centers uh, where they are in those particular communities. And it's interesting because you know, Maury hit it perfectly. Like many of our lines of businesses were here before we showed up, but clients, when they see the bank branch, that's their awareness of our presence. And so um, all of those locations are you know, really important for us and our teams do a great job in those local communities. Yeah, and everyone's got their, their first banking story. Um, I was 14 and I filled out the paperwork wrong. And uh, it didn't go well and I was probably like 15 before uh, I got like my debit card. And uh, it was a learning experience and it was like, oh my gosh, there's, look at all this stuff that they do. And you see some of it on golf commercials, if you're me, of like, all right, they're getting their kids ready for college. But I'm like, oh, I see most people just going through the drive through and like putting checks in and getting checks back and all of that. There's a whole lot that goes into what you guys do. One of the biggest banks in the world. Uh, you have a lot of power and, and clout and uh, you use it for good in like making sure uh, payrolls met and making sure growth happens and people are able to get houses and, and finance their businesses. Um, question for you, Maury, um, with all of your experience in, in banking, what are some of like the personal touch points that are fun and rewarding for you? Because at the end of the day, it is like making sure people's hard-earned money and assets are, are safe, that it's a rewarding job for you. Well, yeah, you, you brought up one, and as your own experience with opening uh, an account, your first account, it's always really rewarding to work with established customers, either they're with the bank or maybe with Merrill Lynch, and they have the next generation who need help. And we have so many things available to be able to assist the next generation, introducing them to either banking, investments, providing them education to helping them make wise decisions and setting them up. A, a lot of times we'll have clients who come in and we'll set the kids up with accounts to be able to go to college and be able to get their, have their first credit card or debit card checking account. And so that's really rewarding to see us be able to help that next generation and also help those who maybe in the past have felt like they were unbankable. We have a lot of products and services to assist those people too in helping them with their financial lives. Yeah, for sure. Because we've all talked to folks that you think are bankers, but they're not. Like they've bought and sold four companies and they have nine houses and four boats and I'll be darned, they can talk and act like a banker because guess what, they've had so much experience with bankers, right? But that all started somewhere, and you mentioned you know, the eight lines of business. Not everyone has access to all of those, but they, th they could theoretically, right? In the, in the little flywheel That's of correct. Bank of America. Yeah. But it all started somewhere for everyone. Um, I'm interested in, Felicia, how you and Maury work together um, with you standing up new markets, with Maury being here. He does have the anecdotal stuff, right? He can talk about the Utah economy and the, each, each geographical place on, on planet Earth has its own quirks and nuances. How do you guys work together as a team? Yeah, it's an a amazing relationship um, where you know, I partner with Maury. As you mentioned, like he's got the expertise in the market. Uh, Maury brings all the eight lines of businesses together, um, whereas my expertise is gonna be with our consumer bank and ensuring that we're in the right locations for those people who uh, need one of our lines of business or all eight, for those people who have $100 and want to grow that 100 or you know they've got a million dollars, they still will walk into our financial centers or interface through our technology uh, to engage with our, with our organization. Um, so having the local expertise that Maury has in addition to his collaboration of bringing, bringing all the businesses together, it makes for a really strong marriage. Uh, we have this thing called co-locations, where effectively uh, we'll have a financial center or bank branch on one side of our building and a, a Merrill uh, facility on the other side of our building. And again, that allows us to, client walks in and they've grown from that $100 checking account to now needing more 
a high level of advice for their investments, and we're able to introduce them to uh, our Merrill side of the side of the house. So it's a really strong relationship. I, I enjoy working f with Felicia because every time she comes here, she says it's her favorite market. So that's really good. But um, you know, Felicia brought up co-location. We just opened Freedom Commons, a financial center in Freedom Commons in downtown Provo. And later this year, in September, we'll be opening our, we'll be moving our Merrill Lynch office to that same location, just up a couple floors where we'll be co-locating the same area. And if I uh, am too uh, simple in this, in this summary, um, the Bank of America side is where you'll start. And if things go well in your life and everything uh, is, is going swimmingly, you'll end up on the Merrill Lynch side eventually. Is that correct? Well, it, you know, we have, it, the way it's set up, it wor really works well. So in each of the financial centers, we have um, financial service advisors who also meet with people who have financial needs. And depending on the size and complexity of their need, we have them, we have them coordinated with a t an actual Merrill Lynch team already. So they can bring that team in of experienced advisors to help somebody if they have more complex needs that need help, or they can help them right there at the same time. And so um, we certainly hope that we're able to provide all those needs for people across the spectrum and have set up a, a system where we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Felicia, back to you with the standing up a new market. Um, People might think, again, based on your guys' brand and reputation, they've got it all figured out. But there's always challenges in life. What are some challenges that, that spinning up a new market entail for you? Maybe some looked around the corner and like, oh, that's not what we anticipated. Let's, <laughs> let's pivot a little bit. What are some of the, the challenges that do arise? Yeah, you know, it's, it's honestly, it's a really, really exciting job that I get a chance to do. Uh, I've been with the bank 12 years and I started in what we call an established market where the branches already exist. You know, we've got you know, 50 or 100 of them already around and there are challenges with those that you know you just don't always anticipate. Um, and so with a brand new market coming into a place like Utah where you look back four years ago, we effectively had no financial centers here and now we've got uh, 20 with the one that we just opened today. Um, so, you know, some of the things is the client awareness, them being aware that we're here. Uh, I, I can't tell you the conversations I've had with clients where they call me about something and they say something to me like, well, hey, when are you going to open more than one branch here? I'm like, well, Tay, tell me where you live. And they'll give me their address. I'm like, you know, I've got four, you know, within driving distance of you. So it's that awareness of our presence and that's why. Um, you know, building these uh, locations and demonstrating to the community we are here and we're gonna we're committed to this market. But the, probably that awareness of our presence has been the biggest challenge. Yeah, because uh, there's a lot of uh, competitors and commotion in the world, regardless of what, whether it's banking or a cookie shop, right? Like, you need some some signage and some real estate to That's show right. that you're here, figuratively and literally. That's right. right? Yeah. Um, so as you uh, as you Get your, uh, your beachhead here in the market. Uh, are there things sequentially that have worked in other markets? You know, like, all right, we've got good coverage. Somebody's was uh, 30 minutes away from there, so now they're only 10. And um, we've got all the lines of business working that the next milestone would be like more offices, more branding, more awareness. What is the line to get to the final success point? Um, so like I mentioned, we're going to continue to invest in this market, but we're really conscientious of uh, ensuring that we don't overbuild and then, you know, let's call it 20 years from now, we've, we've got to make a different decision to go backwards. So we're really methodical about our approach and we don't want to cannibalize any of our locations. Um, but I would tell you kind of our next milestone is really continue to push forward with our technology. Today we're able to uh, interface with a client that is you know, let's call it, um, I'm trying to think of a market where we, where we don't exist today. Um, Park City is a great example. Roughly an hour away. Today, we can have a client sitting in their living room in Park City, and uh, they can have a conversation with our banker, and they can share their screen. And so our banker can have an appointment with them without them having to drive the hour 
to come see us. And so expanding that access to technology where clients, again, they can choose to bank with us and come see us, or we can have a conversation with them just like this. Um, they're, in the, they're in their comfy pajamas and our bankers are able to help them. Because yeah. we've all seen for a long time, like there's been the, the prognostications of like, you're never gonna need to interact with a human again. And uh, the folks of a certain generation are like, no, I always want to interact with a human. I don't care if it's the world's greatest robot <laughs> that has all the answers. I still want that, that trust point. And I found even with the younger generation, they, once they get painted into a corner, they're like, I better go talk to That's an right. actual person. That's right. Um, you guys obviously are, it's in your title, Bank of America. Um, but most people would know that you're heavy on the technology side, right? Um, you have to be, or you would be irrelevant by now. Um, Maury, this question for you, what are, uh, what are some of those things that you guys do to stay cutting edge and that you guys do to stay like ahead of the curve from a technology side? Well, we have a big spend in technology every year as an organization, and it's in the billions of dollars that we spend to stay cutting edge what we do. Um, and we've been noted by a lot of uh, um, a lot of organizations as having the best technology out there, whether it's on the retail banking side for our consumer clients or on the wealth management side for Merrill Lynch clients. But we have great apps that clients can use so that we can meet clients where they want to be met and, and, and make it easy for them to transact their finances. Um, we have, again, great Merrill Lynch apps and great consumer apps uh, that make it easy for them to do business if they don't necessarily need to do it in person. Yeah, and we were joking a little bit beforehand, like all it needs to do is work for the end customer. They don't care about all the blood, sweat, and tears that went into it, or like we barely got this deadline, or this was the hardest thing we ever, they don't care. It just needs to work, and it needs to be safe and secure, it can't be hacked. They shouldn't wake up and see their bank account at zero. Um, so I assume for you guys, like all the folks on the technical side and the R&D side, they make your life easier with that level of trust and probably a bunch of patents, I would assume, as well. Yeah, certainly we have. I think Felicia mentioned earlier um, before, prior to this meeting that we have more patents than any company out there. You know, when you think about it, and you brought up some people want to go into a bank, I think of my parents, both of them are 90 years old now, and it's become very difficult for them to be mobile and get out. My dad gave up driving a couple years ago, and my mom just recently gave up driving. And you know, we think that people in their 90s aren't tech savvy and don't want to have access to that, but it's amazing to watch my own parents, who are both 90 years old, adapt to that environment and learn how to use things on their phone. And they can bank on their phone now and, and they can deposit checks on their phone. And we've made it much easier for people like that to be able to bank now than they once were able to do. Mm -hmm. That is a fantastic point that I've never thought about or heard in all of these podcasts is you know, eventually you might be too old to do what you did when you're 75, 65. And this is your only way, actually. I couldn't even think of what would happen otherwise, right? Like, probably some bad things. You didn't, yeah. you sent a bunch of checks in the mail and that's right. didn't work, right? So, oh, yeah. that's yeah. amazing. Really yeah, during cool. COVID, we actually, uh, you know, everyone was kind of in their home. So, our traffic went down in our financial center significantly. And as Maury mentioned, the mobile users went up significantly. We thought that it was gonna slide back the other direction when you know, kind of COVID was over and people were able to come out more. And certainly our financial center traffic has picked up, but our mobile users have also stayed really steady. So um, it, it's just a reflection of how people want to interface. Yeah, 60% of our clients and customers in Utah are digitally engaged. I, I just have this Seinfeld episode where his grandma was writing him small birthday checks and he, he waited for a long time to cash them and it overdrew her account and she ended up in some alley in Manhattan and uh, a nice guy that looked like a robber was like, no, this bank branch has been closed for a long time, you gotta go over here. And uh, it turned into a funny whole episode, but that wouldn't happen. I remember that, yeah. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, for 
you, Felicia, when you come into a new market, you're standing it up, you've got all of these various moving parts, but um, common sense would dictate that you can get a lot more bees with, with honey than vinegar, right? And I assume like being a part of the community, having community partnerships, sponsoring things, whether it's you know softball league or something even bigger, uh, it goes a long ways in kind of putting that flag down. What are some of the ways you guys think through that and allocate your time and resources to the community? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you asked a question earlier about the partnership between Maury and I, and this is probably the best example of that um, in regards to having the local uh, knowledge of where should we sponsor, what organization should we be involved in, is where his office really uh, hits a home run. Uh, I can tell you from the consumer lens, one of the things that we do that um, I'm really proud of and I know it's well received in the community is called Better Money Habits. And effectively, that's our opportunity to go into nonprofits, go into local schools, and teach uh, those in the audience about ways to manage their funds. And so we don't make assumptions about where people are from. We don't make any assumptions about what they know. The, the program is designed that if you need to understand a little bit more about checking and savings, then our team is certified to teach you that. Uh, if you're interested in moving forward with your finances, um, to invest, to purchase a home, to purchase a car, learning about your credit score and what that means. Our Better Money Habits program is probably the one that is top notch. And it also allows our teammates, like our associates, they want to give back. Uh, and so it gives them that fulfillment of not just you know doing their job, but they can get into the community as well. Oh yeah, Maury, what, what can you add there? Yeah, so we really firmly believe that we have an obligation to give back to the communities in which we operate and where we serve. And we also believe in, uh, in promoting economic mobility and supporting the arts. So, you know, I've got some great examples of where we supported over the last few years. Since 2018, we've invested $4.2 million in the community helping with charitable organizations. One of the programs that we do, a signature program, is called um, Neighborhood Builders. Neighborhood Builders, we provide a nonprofit, two nonprofits a year, $200,000 and leadership training for the person who's leading the organization and another individual. And that really it goes a long ways. Last year, we gave our Neighborhood Builders Award to Guadalupe Center and also Suazo, Suazo Business Center. Because we believe that that really helps lift the entire community and it's, it's just fantastic to see what's that, what that's done in our community and help individuals. We also support the arts, like I said before. One of the ways we support the arts is through grants, and one of the grants we recently did with the Utah Museum of Fine Arts is for a Japanese American who was in the Bay Area, Berkeley area, and during World War II, he was interned in the local um, camp here. And he had uh, drawn a silk print of, it's actually of a horse, it's, it's fairly large, and we were able to provide a grant to the Utah Museum of Fine Arts to help restore that. In the restoration process that occurs in Washington, D.C., they pulled off the, the first layer and found many other drawings that he had done beneath that that were able to help provide financial support to restore those two. That's very cool. So there's a, it's a broad scope of how you guys like give back to the community. Um, and oftentimes it might go under the radar, it seems like, a little bit with this one uh, as an example. Um, that is very cool, because as a wildly successful bank and like an institution of America, um, I think people kind of want that support on the back end, and it's uh, easier said than done. You do th need to think yeah. through it on how uh, you guys are involved in the community, because I'm sure there's a lot of folks that feel like they should be the ones that are uh, benefiting from it so it's as never as easy as it looks and how you guys give back but kudos to you guys and your team for, for doing that a couple more questions here uh, like any other line of business whether you're selling apples or technology or banking there's going to be competitors and there's going to be folks doing things a little bit differently how does Bank of America in general and here locally how do you guys try to uh, differentiate yourselves and your services from others well I I, th I think one of the main ways we do that is that we have representation locally from all our lines of business to be able to help people. 
Uh, we had a longtime client, business banking client, who we introduced to our investment banker locally, and the investment banker was able to help take them public, and that generated um, that generated capital for the owners of this company, who then were able to help with our private bank invest them their money personally. So you know, where a lot of companies may have to bring somebody in from San Francisco or they might have to re deal with somebody remotely, we can do it all here. We can help them from the investment banking needs to going into a consumer financial center to be able to help out with their financial needs. One stop shop. Yeah, that's right. I, I might add, <clears throat> um, when I think about how what differentiates us, and we've already talked about technology, I might add the focus we have on diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, thirty percent of our locations that we have are in low to moderate income areas. It's really important for us to uh, not alienate any community. Likewise, the staff that we hire, the team that we hire. Um, I think here in Utah, we've got six different languages covered uh, that our teammates can speak. Um, so it's really just thinking about um, not really trying to refute the competition, but think about our clients and what our clients need and how we can be there the best for them. Yeah, if I can add just one thing, you know, our purpose is to help make financial lives better through the power of every connection. And we have all those connections available here to help people. Yeah. Um, I graduated high school at the turn of this century, and uh, at the time there's this thing called home economics still. I don't know if it still exists or not, uh, but the old timers were always like griping that we couldn't balance a checkbook and we weren't good uh, financially. Like that's only compounded over uh, the last 20 years of like, man, uh, do you know what a checking account is and it needs to be balanced? And, you try to draw these parallels between like the federal government or any government of like it's got to be balanced, uh, P and L, right? Whatever. There's lots of ways to to do this, um, but uh, it was always the, you see this is the, how you use it in the ledger and the in the checkbook and make sure you you do that and that. It's a lot more complicated than that for financial literacy, but um, depending on who you interact with, uh, maybe their age or like how they grew up. There's some financial literacy issues uh, in every demographic, in every age, and uh, there's a lot of resources out there as well, and it's only additive and beneficial for people to be financially literate, right? Whether they, they want to uh, become rich or they just want to be happy in their lives and, and have everything covered. Um, what does Bank of America do to like make sure people know that there's a lot of resources? That, there's probably a ton from just you guys, let alone the rest of the world. I'm like financial literacy, but how important is it and how do you weave that into all of your other services throughout their journey? So it's extremely important and um, you bring up a, a very good point from the very beginnings a lot of people don't even know how do I open how do I open a bank account, a checking account? Then once it's open how do I balance my checkbook? Uh, and then you could go to people who are nearing retirement when should I take Social Security? You know, should I do it at 62? Should I 65, 67? So we provide education on those and things all in between that. We have something called Better Money Habits where we provide education for people on finances. And we really rely on all our teammates across the company to be able to identify where people have needs and educational needs and then to be able to provide the pr pr proper resources to be able to educate them, whether that's um, a program we have that we can just tap them into or whether it's referring them to another individual who can help with that. Yeah. Anything to add there, Felicia? Um, Maury, Maury nailed it. Uh, I might just go back to when I very first started in banking. I was 20 something and I was managing a, managing a branch and uh, I was in a fairly older community and it, it shocked me, actually it hurt me, how many clients came in who did not know about how to purchase a house. Um, they did not know anything about savings and that's what drives me, um, like that's why I still do what I do. Um, and that's why when we think about being in the community, uh, helping people, living our purpose of making financial lives better, um, that story stays with me and I know it stays with all of our teammates as well. 
Yeah. For sure. And I guess like the silver lining and, and the, the beneficial side to you guys is if your clientele are financially literate, it just makes your job easier. If you can just be like, all right, how comfortable like, I'm good. All right, let's go on to the next one. And it just makes it a lot smoother. So you, you put all that effort at the beginning, it all ultimately culminates with a good end at the ending result. Yeah, yeah. a lot of our clients, like they want to be do-it-yourselfers, right? Um, and we're there when they get to the point where like, uh-oh. And then that's where we can help. Um, we we want to be there for them when they need us. When they don't need us, they can you know continue on using our mobile devices. I mean, they can do a mortgage now, starting it on the app all by themselves. Uh, and then when they get to a certain point where they want advice, they want to talk about rates, et cetera, that's why we're here. Cool. Anything to add there, Maureen? She hit it perfectly. Thanks. Love it. All right. Um, this has been great and, and informative, and I think we've set the table very nicely for, for future conversations. Um, what are you most excited about? We'll start with you, Felicia, as you continue to expand this market. Um, what are you most bullish about, and uh, where do you see you guys in a, in a year or two with a, as, as it relates to your goals? Yeah, uh, this is, uh, like we mentioned, it's a fantastic market. We're going to continue to open financial centers here. Um, We've got, you know, I think right at 80 total locations, inclusive of our ATMs, that clients get a chance to interface with us. Uh, so we're going to continue to grow here, do it at a pace that makes sense. Um, our, obviously, our goal is to continue to take market share. And, you know, I believe we got the best, uh, best financial center for people to come to, best advice, best service, and I want all of them to bank with us. Uh, additionally, I would say the teammates that we have in this market, one of the unique things about being in what we call, it, this is an expansion market for us because we're expanding, one of the unique things is almost every teammate in my organization is fairly new to our company and many of them are new to banking. And we give them, like this becomes their entree into what banking can be. The career opportunities that they have here are exponential. Um, so I'm looking forward to not only growing and opening more financial centers, but that means we increase jobs. And then not only do we increase jobs, we're then able to give them a full career path where they can retire at a company. Which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah for, for anyone who's surfed before, they know it's all about, uh, first of all, having a good wave, and then being positioned correctly for the wave to be able to catch it. And when I look at Bank of America here in Utah, one, we've got a great wave here. We have an incredible economy that continues to grow. We have a population that continues to grow. And we believe we're perfectly positioned now with our lines of business and our financial centers here to be able to catch that wave. So I'm really excited about the future of Bank of America here in Utah over the next five, 10 years. I think we're gonna do great and it's going to help lift our employees, um, our community and, and shareholders too. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Maury. Thank you so much, Felicia, for uh, joining us here on the Meat and Potatoes podcast. Appreciate your time. Learned a lot and looking forward to uh, the next iteration. Thank you thank for having you. us.